Awesome. So I uh, hope everybody's sound is good. If you're not speaking, um, please turn off your sound as we get ready to roll today. My name is Louie McCurley and I'm with Pigeon Mountain Industries, PMI's life safety rope equipment uh, manufacturer here in the United States. And we also have a training division called Vertical Rescue Solutions. I'm here with Brandon Beavers. Uh, at his request, we've created a rope-based business collective to try to provide information and insight to people who are trying to get into the rope access business and trying to develop um, business uh, around the rope access process. And so Brandon, uh, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Absolutely, thank you. So we've been talking for the past month or two, trying to get something going. And we figured what better way to start this series of videos than to have a topic on how to start a business. Just the basic beginning, ins and outs. And I know Mike, you're a little bit, you're a caver, you know a little bit about respective. No, that may not be the business you run, but if you wouldn't mind giving us a quick five minute intro of who you are, what you do, and some of the businesses you ran and built in your. Sure. So my name is Mike Harrison. Um, professionally, I'm a geek. I'm also a caver, a uh, member of SCCI and the NSS, I think still. I pay them some money. Uh, don't do a whole lot of caving much anymore. Uh, historically, uh, PMI used to be one of my customers. Uh, I was their internet service provider for a while back in the 1990s, and they bounced around to various people. Um, mostly what I do is build technology-based companies based on internet uh, utilities, uh, currently building and running one called Ring U, which does uh, business voice telecom uh, all over the nation. And then I also run a, the technical side of a company called Virtual Scan, where we do remote access to, for veterinarians and human doctors uh, to see CT and MRI and x-ray machines. Um, and, and that's that that's what I do. I have started and stopped and killed and birthed, I don't know, more than a dozen real businesses. Um, how's that for a rundown? That'll work. So we've got a list of questions that we're just gonna kind of run off and uh, get a general idea and then at the end we'll have some regular Q and A. The first one is how would you describe to someone with little to no knowledge of starting a business, how to begin the process? Um, bottom line is to realize that you can. Um, when I changed from being an employee of a large Fortune 500 company to starting my first business, I, I literally would wake up every morning and scream at myself going, you need to go find a job. You need to... Um, you, need, you need to go get some money coming in the door and, and forced myself to not do that for a while. And, uh, you know, went and met people and I was then doing medical equipment service and, uh, you know, shake hands and, and talk to people. And eventually you get lucky and somebody goes, yeah, I'll pay you to do that. And, uh, started my own business then. Uh, the important thing in doing a business is to just go out and try it. I've seen people who do all kinds of things first. Uh, oh, I need a website. I need an application. I need business cards. I need, well, you probably need business cards. It helps to even nowadays to give somebody a card with, you know, here's some information, a phone number, an email address, website, whatever. But, but just to, just to get out and get started doing whatever it is. Uh, and don't be afraid to evolve. A lot of times people that start businesses are married to the, the golden idea. And the golden idea is your golden idea, but the world might be wanting to pay you and make you successful at something just a little bit to the side of that. And if you're flexible and you listen to the people that you talk to, they're going to tell you what they're willing to pay for and they're going to evaluate you and your skills and services and, and what you're able to do and, and figure out if there's a fit or not. More than anything else, uh, to be honest, and just go try it. And, and I, I think that's the first step is just to give it a try. Sounds good. So there's different 
types of businesses that I've seen, sole, sole proprietor, LLC, and corporation. I don't assume somebody that's freshly starting a business is probably going to go with a corporation. But can you elaborate on some of the differences, pros and cons, what somebody might want to do or start off with? Yeah, so um, specifically, start thinking of yourself as a business. Um, every every single individual on the planet ought to mentally think of themselves as a business. And that's typically in the business world, that's called a DBA. Uh, and my first company was a little side gig when I was in the Air Force. And it was just me doing business as this other name. And yeah, I didn't even have a checking account. I'd sometimes get some money and put it in my pocket. Um, th that's the first step. LLCs are currently, and there's different types of LLCs. You need to talk to a lawyer and accountant, see which is best for you. But LLCs are currently where most businesses fall. In theoretically, they were for professional type companies, and there's a professional type corporation that's a little bit different. Um, but an LLC is a good place to start. Uh, it's usually real, relatively inexpensive. In theory, it limits your liability. In reality, it's just the cheapest way to to get a bank account and other things in your name or in the name of two or three people so that it's its own entity. C corporations, um, I've owned and been a member of a couple of C corporations, a little bit more of a headache, but C corporations have something that LLCs typically don't and that C corporations have stock that you can hand out, sell, assign, and do other things with. C corporations are typically used in the technology business world where you're seeking venture capital and investors beyond what you would call an angel investor. Uh, angel investors are your friends, family credit cards, their credit cards, uh, their home lines of mortgage. Um, when you get past that stage, uh, an LLC, people can put money into an LLC and invest, but after that you go for a C company and you print stock and it starts off being worthless and, and goes from there. All right. So elaborating a little bit more on say someone's going to do an LLC, what is the process? Do you typically want to pay for a service to have them do it for you? How hard is it to do it yourself? <sighs> Yeah, uh, currently nowadays, bluntly, uh, go to LegalZoom.com and get started there. Uh, if you're a startup and don't know what you're doing and don't know why you're doing it, your, your first one's a gimme. LegalZoom is neither good nor bad. Uh, it, it can be either. But if you go and answer questions there, pick the state that you want to incorporate. And I, I highly recommend that you pick the state that you're physically in. I have a love-hate thing with Tennessee. The Tennessee Department of Revenue is an absolute pain in the butt to deal with. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that on a video, but they are. However, uh, Ring U is a Tennessee-based company. We advertise as a Chattanooga, Tennessee-based company, and that's a good place to start is just being an LLC in your company. Um, Companies evolve. It's not unusual to start something and decide that nine months from now when you're making lots of money and you start talking to an accountant and a lawyer, they tell you to do something else and would like to change it. But in reality, once that paperwork's filed, it doesn't really matter if you paid a lawyer an awful lot of money to start it or you're using pretty much boilerplate paperwork to do it until the shit hits the fan. When, the, when things go wrong, that's going to be a difference because there might be some clauses in something that a lawyer did for your specific case of interest. But most of the time, if you're at the point where you're having to read the small print in your LLC or corporation bylaws and things like that to deal with people problems, investors and money, you've already lost. The, the lawyers are going to win and, and you're in trouble. Um, I, I recommend you get started and, you know, evaluate it in six months or a year and see what happens after that, because you may decide that this original company doesn't fit your needs and you sell its assets to another company and, and start all over again. And don't be afraid to do that. Uh, most businesses, I won't say fail, but most businesses evolve very quickly as they get started. People get interested. They decide they have to buy vehicles or equipment or tools or pay for, pay for things. All right. What would you say about the sole, sole 
pride. We do say that that's a good way to start for someone that's just trying to figure it out. Yeah, or... that, in, in my world, that's a DBA. Um, but yes, yeah, sole proprietorship is, I mean, if, if Brandon is out doing anything as just Brandon, be a sole proprietorship. As Brandon accumulates assets, um, start off with you've got a house and a bus and wife and kids and all that. Uh, you might not want to risk those things, but uh, you create the company different from the sole proprietorship to to protect yourself from liability. Uh, you want to be, you want your business to be separate from your house and your wife and your cars and you know your kids' education fund and things like that. Um, but if 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 your liability in doing whatever it is you're doing isn't that high, be a sole proprietorship. And I'm not a lawyer, nor am I paying one on YouTube. <laughs> awesome. One second. All right. So another point of starting a business is figuring out the accounting aspect of it. Would you typically advise a new business owner to use a business like QuickBooks to handle it? Or so it I yeah, I have a love-hate thing with QuickBooks. Um, QuickBooks is a pain in the butt, but finding a bookkeeper that can help you with QuickBooks or a tax accountant who can help you configure QuickBooks and make it do the things that QuickBooks does really nicely and help you do payroll and taxes and things like that, it, it, it's kind of the, it, it's the Chevy 350 of of the accounting world or in PMI terms, it's the pit rope of the, the accounting rope. It's the, you know, you can't go wrong by grabbing it. You may not need that 11 millimeter stiff static rope, but it's gonna work. Um, other people have also liked that program called FreshBooks. If mostly what you're doing is just invoicing people, uh, a website called FreshBooks does that really well. And don't be afraid to just pull out a spreadsheet or word processor and hand do your first 20 to 100 invoices. It, it, it's okay to you know, print them out and put them in a pile and hand them to your tax accountant at the end of the first year. People get mired down in the details. Um, in, in the telecom world specifically, we have a term called de minimis where until you start making a, so, a certain amount of money, not a lot of the details matter. I, apply that to your own personal startup business. You know, th think of yourself as, as a business and don't sweat the details too much so long as you make sure that you've, you've put money aside to pay the tax man. All right. So on to the fun part. How to, <laughs> how to charge for your services. Now, there's a lot of how much do I need for my profit, the business profit, how much is time, labor, and materials. How do you charge for your business or advise someone to start breaking it down when they're charging for the product? There, there are three types of businesses in my, my mind. One is where you charge hourly per services. And when you do that, you have to make sure that you're paying for or getting charged for or getting paid for all of the dead time. If you think you're making $50 an hour and that's really good money, you also have to consider the 100 hours in that job that you spent in marketing and getting that customer that's paying you $50 an hour for the next 100 hours. So that, that $50 an hour might actually only be making you $20 an hour. And by the time you collect taxes and insurance and pay for, you know, your mileage and things like that, that eats, that eats a hole up in the, in the world. I haven't done the math in a long time, but in the 1990s, um, I had put a lot of work into figuring that a human being working on a job as a contractor before they start making any real money in their pocket cost $37 an hour. Now that was doing stuff for hospitals, but that's what it took to have a truck and tools and insurance and business cards and you know all the normal things that make up almost any business. You gotta charge $37 an hour if you're billing out. And I think that was based on 50% billable time. Other kinds of, of businesses, and, and I really like something called recurring revenue or being paid uh, for services that aren't necessarily tied to your time. Um, if you're manufacturing something, you can manufacture an awful lot of rope or 
carabiners or equipment. And, and that doesn't necessarily relate exactly to the amount of time you've got in employee resources and payroll. It also has to do with your, your, your how much nylon you've bought or, or other resources. Um, when, when you're manufacturing something, you also have to then consider your development costs and things like that. And things get expensive really quick. The last type of, of way to get paid is recurring revenue that, that's considered passive. For example, if you're a consultant or a lawyer that doesn't actually put time in for billing, but gets to bill a customer $500 a month just to be available. If you were a rope access technician, supervisor, a liability consultant, or something like that, you might be able to charge your clients just to be on call and be part of their their entourage that they can get a hold of when needed. Uh, engineering uh, firms do an awful lot of this, especially safety engineering. The um, the best type for, for me in a business is things where I sit back and watch people pay me for things and I get to make money. One of the reasons I'm in the telecom business, and I hate it, but I love getting paid every day, no matter what, people pay their phone bills and we make a small percentage on their phone bills. And sometimes I have to answer the phone and, and do crazy things. Um, and as far as getting paid, uh, don't get paid in Bitcoin unless you're able to, to turn that around to cash really fast. Uh, but Venmo, PayPal, uh, credit card merchant accounts, if you become a real business, uh, be careful when you get them. Uh, but you can get a good credit card merchant account and pay about 3% in services and, and take those. But I, I'm seeing a lot of the smaller businesses, you know, PayPal only. And PayPal, if you've got a PayPal account, you can take a credit card with a PayPal account. People can put in their credit card numbers and pay you money. And there's a fee for it. But until you get large enough that that fee's a problem, that's a valid way to get paid. I'm not hearing you, Brandon. I think you're on mute. There we go. Can you hear hey, me now? I can hear you now. Uh, another one is insurance. I know that I'm nervous when it comes to getting insurance because not a lot of insurance companies understand what rope access is or that line of work. Yeah. You may not have information on that specifically, but you can kind of give us a window into your life for how insurance works. The closest thing I would have to the rope access world is when I was fixing medical equipment, I had to have a $1 million insurance policy just for my professional liability. And it got expensive enough over time that I wasn't doing enough work to do that. I was doing more general IT work. But we had to go to a company, I think I was using specialty underwriters out of Michigan. Um, and, and, you know, you fill out the paperwork and they look at you and you document all of the things that you're doing to be safe and they assess your liability and they give you, you know, something. You're going to need that in the rope access world. You're also going to need insurance, I would assume, for any damage you were to cause intentionally or accidentally. Um, but that, 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 yeah, you, and you factor that into your costs. Do you have any tips for driving down prices or what can help get approved? Yeah, if I were, if I were doing what y'all were doing, um, I would have everything documented policy and procedures and I would probably set up a couple of long, long-term recording webcams to watch you at work <laughs> and say, we're doing this to show that, you know, we're doing everything possibly correctly and to limit the insurance company's liability. They don't care about you. They care about their liability. So if you're doing things to protect their liability, they might be proactive. I in the medical equipment world, when we were doing biomedical engineering, the joke was, is for every three technicians, we had one person who all they did was document what the other person did full time. And, and while that was a joke, that's really what it worked out to. We had a person who, you know, made sure everything was documented. I actually sped up processes by having somebody follow some of the technicians around and have them take pictures and write down, you know, picked up screwdriver and tightened counterclockwise, you know, blah, 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 uh, 14 kilonewtons or foot pounds and, and, and document all that type of thing because the liability in fixing medical equipment was that high. You're in the same world. Um, having somebody to document things or, or nowadays, you know, a, a, a GoPro, you know, that, that shows that you, you know, use the right tool and, and did something correctly is going to save you and them. 
Awesome. So let's say business is started, have insurance, you have everything, and it's going well. You're starting to build. At what point do you hire an employee? At what point does it become feasible? <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> um, if, you're, if you're trying to keep yourself employed and fed, a one-person business is fantastic. Um, and you can do that and make a lot of money. But you can't scale that. And the only way that you're going to, to become more than a one-person business is as soon as you're able to hire somebody that else that you can trust to do things well and for you to turn around and work on growing that business or being the lead troubleshooter um, as fast as you can afford it. And you're going to hate me for this, but you're going to end up paying them more than you make. Uh, you will work twice as many hours and, and get almost half the pay and you will pay other people well and you'll make sure they go to lunch and take their breaks and have vacations and have the right tools for the job. And when you get to three or four of those people, you start making real money again. Sorry. All right. <laughs> That's good information. Can you explain to us exactly how workers' comp work, when to get it, why you need it? Uh, that's something I always ask my bookkeeper, and we just pay it. Uh, I haven't had a business that's actually had a workman's comp claim in a long time. And uh, if you do, you pretty much are stuck on paying it unless you're doing lots and lots and lots of documentation as to why you shouldn't. Um, I, I'm not a good HR expert. Um, I tend to hire people at will and fire them for absolutely no reason at all. Uh, and, and in Tennessee, that's a safer way to do it. It depends on where you are, where you're incorporated, the state, uh, the business. Um, what I mean, if you're hiring a $10 an hour person, that's different than somebody that you're paying $100,000 a year to. But uh, this is where if you hiring somebody else, you talk to your bookkeeper, whoever's doing your taxes, you make sure that you pay workers comp and hope that you never, ever, ever have a claim. So with workers comp, if you do have a claim, are you still liable for paying or is that what you pay workers comp for? Uh, there's, a, I, I, there's some shared liability in that. Uh, the one time that I had a workers comp claim, it upped the, the workers comp that the company paid for a while. So we essentially, uh, I mean, HTS essentially paid for the workers comp that we had to do. It didn't, it didn't directly come out of our pocket, but essentially over a couple of years, we ended up paying that workers comp out of our pocket. And uh, I don't remember the details, but I remember that it cost us real money. And that was 1990s. I mean, I haven't had a business that's had that kind of problem in a long time. Even a relatively inexpensive employee, though, can cost you a boatload of money if you don't have workman's comp insurance. And so yep. I would suggest that if you have an employee, you have a work, you yes. have worker's comp insurance. You just do. Yes. Um, now you can hire them as a subcontractor to your subcontracting position. And if you hire them as a sub, then, you know, that changes the equation a bit. Mike, what are your thoughts on that? I tend to not. I have been the sub of a sub of a sub, but I've never been the person who's used. <laughs> I've never been the person that's uh, hired subs beyond one level. I've hired 1099 employees, but I, I hire them for things like software programming. Um, I've occasionally hired them for doing some home remodeling and things like that, but th th that's a completely different world. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, the, the whole the whole insurance question is a really murky, messy one, and and you know you're you're kind of you're kind of putting yourself at big risk if you decide to yeah. fly naked on that. And to that end, I, I would like to revisit just real quick. I'd like to go back to the the liability insurance and the um, you know that piece, and just you know you you touched on on you know the fact that you ought to have it, but just in, in my world, I deal with a lot of people who, a lot of rope access technicians and or um, instructors who are private, you know, self-employed basically, and yeah. choose not to have it. And as a, as a company, I choose not to use those people. Um, I, <laughs> yes. I, I, I think that, that this would be a great time for you to tell us why, why would I bother 
having um, my own insurance as a self-employed uh, subcontractor or contractor? I, I think number one is just to protect your personal assets, but you also brought up another good point. I, I have a I have a business philosophy where I like doing business with people that are actually in business. And, you know, it's one thing for a guy to walk by, I'll, I'll use a tree trimmer, for example, uh, the guy walks by with a chainsaw and says, Hey man, do you need your trees trimmed? I'm probably passing. Uh, but when, uh, blew it. The guys that I know, I know they're bonded. They've got trucks with their names on it. I know they have insurance. Um, I know I can call them and they'll show up. Uh, you know, I'm hiring a professional whom this is their job. They have invested in their skills. They're, I, I expect to have to pay them more money. Um, but I, I also am expecting a better job because that person's uh, invested in their, in their career. Uh, yeah, if I were hiring a rope access technician and they told me that, and it was just a solo type job and they told me that they didn't have their own insurance and things like that, I'd wonder how committed they were to their business. I can tell um, you that the vast majority of rope access techs today do not carry their own insurance. Is this possibly a business opportunity to, to uh, say if you uh, follow these rules and guidelines, you can get insurance for X dollars for X dollars a month? Is there, an, is there an organization that does this? I, I don't know. That is how a businessman thinks. That's why we're having this conversation <laughs> with you, Mike. <laughs> well, I'm not doing an insurance business, but that is definitely the kind of thing that you just identified a need and that maybe um, finding a friendly insurance company to say, hey, through this, this organization, Sprat or whoever, uh, we can give you a good deal you know, by saying that you're SPRAT certified, that you follow these, these policies and procedures, use these materials, you know, those types of things, um, you might be able to get a good deal on insurance. That's a great point. By PMI rope. <laughs> as long as you're using PMI rope, we can get you some insurance. <laughs> uh, I've got a bunch of it in the garage. Some of it needs to go away, but uh, it, it, it's old. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. Is there anything else on that topic that you want to hit, Louis? Uh, no, I don't think so. Thanks, Brandon. All right. So, naming a business. Ooh, you, this I'm good at. <laughs> I'm just going to let you take it away then. Uh, be as generic as possible within the realms of what you're doing business in. Um, I, 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 I'm going to make a joke of this, but you know, the, I only do rope access on Fridays.com is probably not a good business name, but uh, something that includes the idea or concept of what it is you're doing and isn't too limiting. And my reason is, is, you know, if you named it windmill repair and somebody calls you up and wants you to do some really, really cool rope uh, roof work, well, they're not going to talk to the windmill repair people. Um, so, so you might want to be a little bit generic and as short as possible. Um, I violate this with ring u.com because uh, I wasn't the person who picked the domain name, but uh, if you can get a business name that flows and is something you can spell on a domain name and email address and things like that without dashes, hyphens, weird characters and things like that, please do make it as, as easy for someone to, would you say that was and write it down as possible um, or at least an acronym that, that is, that is findable. Uh, please make it as simple. And if you're not a serious business kind of thing, uh, if you're not IBM international business machines, have fun with it. Uh, people remember business names with fun. Um, my personal business name is geek labs. And people see this and have, I've started more weird conversations as, oh, here, it's on, it's on my phone too. Oh, by, by the way, branding. Um, yeah, Geek Labs and Ring You, that's me. By carrying this thing around, I've started more conversations and people go, well, how do I spell that? And I go, oh, just like this. And they're like, oh, that's how. Um, so, so, so keep it something that you can, uh, you can easily convey. Other than that, I mean, do you buy things on eBay? That doesn't mean a darn thing. Uh, Zoom for video conferencing doesn't mean a darn thing. Amazon.com is a place to go buy things. It's a river. 
Um, you know, so, so again, if you can find something short and easy to convey and you can put some meaning behind, go for it. Uh, and, and my personal feeling is have fun with it. You're, you know, you're going to get remembered if you have fun with it. All right. And to go with a name, you need a logo. What makes a good logo in your, uh, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, could you read this from there? The first rule that I got taught from a typesetter about business cards and logos was you need to be able to throw that business card with the logo and your company name or whatever down on a table and be able to tell what it is from standing, you know, a two, three feet away. And, and it needs to look good in color and in black and white. Now those are rules from Tom Kunish, who's an awesome human being and, and used to do an awful lot of crazy stuff with me uh, business-wise. But those were his rules, and I think those were good rules. Uh, if you look at, I got something here from SunTrust. You know, that's identifiable. If it was, if it was turned around, it would still, you know, you still recognize it as a SunTrust logo. Uh, keep it simple. People who do really fancy logos, it just fades into the color background mess and nobody ever sees it. You asked. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. Um, so what are a few of your just best advice for business owners starting or existing? Um, I'm going to laugh at this one, but when, when dealing with other people, go with your gut. Uh, I have done more business over a handshake and one piece of paper than most people have done on hundred page contracts. Uh, if you're talking to employees or clients or prospective clients and you don't have a good feeling, go with your gut and, and, and walk away. Uh, I've seen more people lose their businesses and thousands or sometimes almost millions of dollars by, by forcing something that isn't going to work um, in, into place. And, and you're going to know when you're working with other OPEX technicians or a client and that if they're the kind of people that are nickel diming you to death and being really weird about stuff, they're probably going to treat you that way for about everything. Um, and the same goes when you're talking to your, your potential employees. Um, if, if you know you're taking a risk with some employees and you understand their position, do it. But, that, but that's my, my number one advice is go with your gut. Um, just because the contract says something doesn't mean a darn thing when things go south. All right. Um, I have a question for you, Louie, that you were talking about earlier, I wanted to revisit. Um, you said that it changes the equation a little bit when you start subcontracting out and subcontracting on top of that. How does that affect things insurance-wise and uh, how did that change? Yeah, the, the, it, it changes a lot, actually. Um, as, okay. as an employer, if I'm employing somebody directly, then their workers' comp is on me. So from a workers' compensation standpoint, um, if they're not working for me, as in if they are not employed by me, then they're under their own workers' comp insurance or not. Um, a, lo a lot of sole proprietors don't, or you don't have, you don't have self, you don't have uh, insurance on yourself typically. And so uh, that, that could be a problem. You're actually better off working as an employee of me than you are working for yourself because if you chop your finger off and you work for me, I get to pay for it. Um, whether whether it's your medical bills or for the time off work or yeah. um, whatever. The same goes for uh, liability insurance. If um, now now OSHA has a, I mean actually it's a whole nother story is is the whole liability for for OSHA and um, compliance issues, but um, from a liability standpoint, if you work for yourself and I hire you, if, if you get, if, if I get sued for something that you did, I'm going to hand that puppy right back to you. Um, and I'm going to say, Hey, I, I didn't do it. The guy that was working for me did it. And so they're, they're going to find both of us at fault. 
Um, but chances are they'll find you at fault more than me because you actually did the action. Um, whereas if you work for me and I have policies and procedures, you're responsible for following those policies and procedures as an employee. But, uh, but then I'm fully responsible for you. If, you. if you are following those procedures and you're doing what you're told and something really, really bad happens, um, it's on me. And, and so that protects you. All right. That is most of my list. Louis, what do you have for my list or anything you, at all? You know, I think um, I think it's it's been really, really well covered today. I think that um, obviously there's a, a ton of, of knowledge and experience there, Mike. I think you've got uh, years and years in, of experience in all sorts of different kinds of industries, which makes a big, big difference. Um, seeing things from multiple perspectives, you're able to sort of bring to the surface all of the really key uh, key points. And I really like the things you. that you've brought out. Um, the importance of the importance of a name. You're right. You know, it's super important whether people remember you. Um, being professional about what you do and taking yourself seriously as a business. For goodness sakes. Um, you know, just because you're a tree trimmer and, and you run your own business in your own guy doesn't mean you ought to go out yeah. looking and acting like a slug. Um, so it's, it's yeah. really, really, really good points. Well, I really thank you for being with us today. Um, this is a, a cool kickoff. Um, we are planning to uh, publish this uh, on a uh, public forum where people can uh, take a look at it and hopefully enjoy the opportunity to uh, hear what you had to say. So if you have uh, anything else that you'd like to add, now is probably the time. Nah, just be prepared for people to yell at me and tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> hey, that's, that's life, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the other weird thing, I, I have a weird uh, comment about people. Uh, I used to get involved in a lot of startup companies and I learned to never tell anybody that their idea was stupid. Um, everybody that would come to me had different experiences and different knowledge. And I would look at something and go, that's the silliest idea I've ever heard of. And then I would watch them make it work. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's the, the thing is you think about your ideas and people talk about ideas and all it is, is, you know, people make things work that don't make any sense at all. You, you, you're going to start a company that's going to have people drive around like taxi cabs, but they're not going to actually be taxi cars and they're not going to actually work for you. And it became Uber. <laughs> my, my favorite story on that front is um, I was working eco challenge in Australia. What? Nice. Years ago. And the guy who produced that show, um, we worked pretty closely together. And so we were hanging out one evening and chatting about various ideas and things. And he said, you know, I've got this great idea for a show. And, and he said, here, I'll pitch it to you. And he said, I, I, wanted, I think we ought to take a bunch of people who don't know each other and put them on an island. And you know how, <laughs> you know that joke about, you know, 10 people in a boat and you throw them out one at a time <clears throat> based on whatever. Yeah. He said, that is the most horrid idea. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're illuminating the worst of human character. And he's like, yeah, isn't it great? And I thought, <laughs> oh, you're crazy. And you know how many millions they have made with Survivor? <laughs> yes. Yeah. A lot, 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 like I said, as, and as you talk to people for your collective rope access, whatever, uh, as people do things, it's not always going to be things that they're going to be doing rope access the way you think it is. Someone's going to have a different twist on things. And, That's right. That's right. Yeah. Cool. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And, Thank and you. likewise.